Welcome and good morning. Um, first, wanted to thank Jen Kuluta to who helped us, uh, invited us to be here with you today and, and help me coordinate this. We're very excited to be here. Um, and um, let me get, let's get started on introductions. I'll let my director, Leslie Orla, go first. Welcome. Um, happy to be here. My name is Leslie Orloff. I direct the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project at American University Washington College of Law. Um, I'm a family lawyer by trade. Uh, I practiced family law for like 17 years, but was also involved as one of the lead lobbyists, I guess you could say, writing um, the Violence Against Women Act, immigration provisions, the U visa, the T visa, um, and I really love doing these trainings because all of those laws are just piece of, pieces of paper without the help from people like you that um, help victims actually use, get access to these legal protections. So I'm happy to be here and look forward to answering your questions, providing you information and supporting your work. Thank you. We'll see you. Yep. Good morning, everyone. I'm the deputy director at the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project. Um, my background is practicing immigration law, um, the, some of the remedies that we're going to talk about today. And uh, let's, what our, pro our program does is we provide uh, technical assistance. So basically, that means the information, resources. Um, people can call on us for case consultations. And you, people like you um, can can reach out to us and let us know how we can assist you in your work in serving immigrant victims, survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking, and that's a, in a little nutshell a piece of the work that we do. I wanted just to remind you all that as um, uh, that today we'll, the, we're going to talk about remedies under the Violence Against Women Act, but that the Violence Against Women Act also protects women, men, and children all the same. Um, maybe as we talk about examples in our presentation, we might refer to women, um, just because that's still a very high prevalent number of um of, of who we see statistically that is a survivor or victim of these crimes, but it, it um, but you know we want to be mindful of those that are LGBTQ or elderly victims. Um, there's also um, uh, this this law applies equally to everyone, and we're going to change in. You'll see us sometimes say victim, sometimes say survivor, but that's just we mean the same thing. You want to do the learning objectives, Leslie? Sure. Um, so by the end of this webinar, participants, you'll be able to better screen and help eligible victims of domestic and sexual violence, child abuse, human trafficking, file uh, VAWA, T, U, and U visa cases, and for special immigrant juvenile status relief. Um, you'll be able to help victims receive protection under VAWA Violence Against Women Act confidentiality laws, and understand the role advocates can play in helping victims who are filing these cases. We have the materials to share with you. We've created a web page, um, and in the PowerPoints and slides, uh, right now just the PowerPoints are there. And if they're not there, they'll be up within five minutes. Um, I'm going to put go ahead and share it here in the link for everyone. It's in our web library, and that's also a resource for you to use later because there's a wealth and wide range of stuff there. But it's there in the chat. It's New Web Library, WCL American, EDU, Webinar Series, Middlesex, March 2022. And we're going to be posting there a variety and links to like all kinds of materials that um, will provide you further information on this. Um, and I'm assuming that'll all get posted either today or tomorrow um, uh, we're, we're, when we identify the student who's going to be creating the page for us. <laughs> so, And then also wanted to tell you, we're going to be covering these immigration remedies. It, 
but on its own, probably each one could be maybe an hour and a half session, if not more. And um, we kind of highlighted what we think is most important of each remedy, but we also wanted to give you a lot of stuff in the material so that you can reference later, because for some of you, maybe it's your first time hearing about it. Um, so the slides have a lot of information for you to reference at a later date. We might not get to everything on each slide, but it, we wanted to create something good for you to go back and look onto. And, and related to that, um, we encourage you to ask questions. Um, please ask them in the chat. You don't have to wait until the end. We can ask them as we go. If there are particular things, you know, you signed up for this, if there are particular things you want to be sure to know, go ahead and type them in the chat now and we'll work the responses and answers to that in the presentation as we go forward. Yeah, good Back point. We're a great group here. And um, we also wanted to have you save the date and, and Jen, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we're gonna have part two of this and that's going to be on April 28th, same, same time, same, same day of the week on Thursday. And so if you wanna go ahead and save the date, if you've already registered for this event, I'll automatically send you the link and assume that you wanna hear part two of this because the, it all pretty much goes together, right? We're gonna talk about these immigration remedies, but um, next part two, um, you wanna tell us why it's important that, and why they go together, Leslie? Sure. Um... So basically, lots of times people will call us and they'll say, I want to help my client get public benefits. Does she qualify for housing? Does she qualify for health care? And the, the issue is when you're working with immigrant survivors, the immigration remedies are connected to the public benefits options. So we're going to, I've, we've done a state by state chart. So I have a chart with all of the links and all of the um, sources of law that support which immigrant survivors that you're working with in New Jersey are eligible for which benefits, because it varies. So if you're working with somebody, we also have similar charts for New York or for Delaware, um, you know, or in Pennsylvania. I mean, the issue here is if you work where you live, where you're working, um, which immigrant, which public benefits somebody qualifies varies by that. There's a bunch of public benefits and services that are available to everybody without regard to immigration status that we'll be covering, but we'll also specifically be covering which forms of immigration relief bring which benefits in New Jersey in the next training. And I'm also gonna be talking about some of the special issues that arise um, in cases of protection orders for immigrant survivors. So oh, that's April 28th at 10 a.m. So let's get started. Okay, so um, if you guys could just put in the chat, um, if you are a victim advocate, what your role is in your agency. And then that way we know um, it, a little more about what you do and to tailor um, what we teach on based on that. As you do that, um, we wanted to know uh, what barriers and fears do you think prevent immigrant and refugee survivors from seeking help? So you can go ahead and write that in the chat. So two things going on in the chat at the same time. <laughs> I know they can handle it. And so what are the, what are some of the barriers? What are some of the fears? Um, that you think prevent immigrant survivors from coming to seek help. So someone shares fear of deportation, lack of understanding of rights in the legal system. Language barriers. Make the chat bigger. We've got people working at government agencies, people working at legal services, um, victim advocates, paralegals. Um, one of the, pro the issues that they raise is length of approval times, how long it takes to get the immigration remedy. We'll be definitely talking about that. Analysts, law enforcement. What's CSVA stand for in your, can somebody spell it out? Confidential Sexual Violence Advocate. 
Ah, oh, great. Okay. Lack of understanding of the US system and understanding that there's relief for domestic violence victims. So those are, those are a lot of what we see. And we have to remember that those misconceptions like the lack of understanding of the legal system, the fears, the language access, those all sometimes intersect. And it sometimes intersects with you know, poverty, other lack of access, disabilities. And so all those things exist sometimes for one person altogether. And these are some of the things that you say, but what we hear a lot from the technical assistance is definitely the fear of deportation, fear of being separated from their children, um, language access being a barrier to why people don't seek help. Sometimes the retaliation from the abuser or the perpetrator uh, that they're gonna turn them into USCIS. And there's not that trust that they have in advocates, attorneys, or police and prosecutors or judges based on maybe experiences that they've had in the home country. And so how do you think that filing for immigration relief can help bring down some of those barriers and misconceptions that you all mentioned? What is, it, what is having immigration status or relief gonna do for, for victims? How might it help? And opens up opportunities for employment and housing. Other way, other ideas? It's interesting, you don't see when it says people are typing, it's just, it just shows that, there we go. Um, user can't use immigration status against them, absolutely. It's a big one. Provides independence. Yeah, and with independence, you know, to file in for any of these remedies, they don't have to leave their abuser, you know, for many reasons and sometimes very good reasons they do not, um, but it does provide that ability to become economically stable. And so economic status, uh, immigration status does provide employment authorization and that becomes key to being independent. Right. And it opens up a lot of different kinds of options. Um, so this is, gives options. I and mean, one of the things we know is that once victims begin the process of filing and get to the point where they have legal immigration status or point where they get protect, formal protection from deportation and work authorization, um, their economic status soars, their willingness to use the court system improves, um, their willingness to get protection orders and custody and, and their access to public benefits opens up as well. So all of this with immigration status as you get comes employment, comes protection from deportation. We'll be talking about exactly how that happens because you get some initial protection and more comes later. Um, it gives them uh, access to driver's licenses and social security numbers. They get more access to public and assisted housing, different housing options, breaks their isolation. Um, ultimately, when they finally get their green cards, usually um, they are able to travel to and from the US and it gives them a path to lawful permanent residency and citizenship. Next slide, please. And so, you guys mentioned, I mean, this issue about immigration related abuse is a big issue for survivors. It's the biggest issue, actually. It's the elephant in the room. And that abusers um, will refuse to file an immigration papers if they hear that she or they believe she might be considering leaving. They will, you know, threaten to call and deport them. And they actually do make those calls to DHS. Um, and then they, they may try to force her to work with false documents and then turn her in. But immigration related abuse is a big issue. Next slide, please. And so, and what we found, this is actually data that I took to Congress when we wrote the VAWA self petition. Um, we found that um, we did some research among immigrant mostly Latinas in DC, the initial research, although it's been repeated with multiple populations, South Asian women and other women, immigrant women. 
And basically we find that immigrant women have higher rates of abuse um, in marriages in particular than, uh, not, than citizens. And that um, those married to US citizens or lawful permanent residents that, that reaches over 50% um, probability. And when you only look at people married or former mar formerly married to citizens, that rate jumps to almost 60%, which is three times the national average. Next slide, please. And that um, what we find is that power and control over immigration status and domestic violence relationships, um, we were able to show that in all, over 70% of the time when an abuser could file immigration papers for his wife, he doesn't. And that in like 27.7% of the time that when they do file, there's a mean delay of almost four years. And we see this in 65% of the cases reported by immigrant survivors nationally. So threats to um, this whole issue about immigration related abuse I'm gonna be giving me away my age in this a little bit, but um, for those of you that are do a lot of domestic violence work, I like to think about this, this these immigration related power and control um, issues that you'll see in uh, immigration related abuse. It's like a cut telephone cord in the old days where um, you know, you'd come into a house, police would come into a house and the telephone cord would be cut and that's corroborating evidence of domestic violence. This power and control, this immigration related abuse is 10 times higher when there's physical or sexual abuse occurring in the relationship than when there's emotional abuse. So it is directly tied to um, the, uh, the higher rates of abuse and it corroborates the existence of, um, of the abuse in the relationship. And we've trained the Department of Homeland Security on this. So you don't you don't want to avoid telling them about the immigration related abuse. You want it to be part of your case that you file um, with DHS. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we found is that there's a serious vulnerability, um, particularly for recent immigrant girls um, who come to the United States. They're twice as likely um, to have been suffered sexual assault by high school than their citizen peers. And um, Latina college students, for example, have the highest rate, rate, rate of attempted rape compared to white African-American and Asian college students. So you'll see there are high rates of sexual assault in this population as well, and you wanna be sure to screen for both. Lucia? Yeah. So as you're screening and somebody shares with you that they're having threats of deportation or some kind of immigration related abuse that Leslie talked about, it's really important to check for the other forms of abuse because as Leslie said, it's the, the chances of that happening are, are higher statistically. And so, as I explained earlier, with immigration relief, with language access, we're able to reduce a lot of those fears, misconceptions, and barriers that seek, that prevent immigrant survivors from seeking help. Um, so it's important to screen early, um, know the kind of immigration relief that we're going to talk about help them document the abuse so to support their applications. Um, try to know a little bit of the difference of the immigration options because there are some that have faster access to public benefits and better access to uh, faster access to lawful permanent residency. Um, and then incorporate that into your safety planning as you think about maybe accessing protection orders or filing for divorce or other, other um, remedies that consider that a lot of times it might be safer to file for that immigration remedy beforehand. And I'm going to explain why that's true. So if you think about it, if they're going to file for divorce or a protection order, they're going to serve papers on the abuser. And what we've seen happen in many cases as soon as the abuser gets served with court papers, what does he do? He picks up the phone and tries to call DHS to turn her in. Not always, but often. And so the only protection, and you, so what happens is, next slide please, is we created VAWA confidentiality to deal with that issue. So what happens is when, so the Department of Homeland Security is barred 
from relying on perpetrator provided information to harm a victim. The problem is how do they know that the person they're getting a tip from is a perpetrator? The only way they know is if the victim, they're supposed to know. So for example, in any case where there's a marriage, if a husband calls in to turn in a wife, that's supposed to be a red flag and they're not supposed to respond. That is nice on paper, but it doesn't really work. What does work is the moment a victim files an immigration case, a VAWA, a T, a U case, or a U visa immigration case, it gets within less than a week put in a red flag system that informs immigration enforcement officials that this person is a victim. So when they get a tip and they're going to go after her, they're mandated by policy to check that system. And if they see she's a victim, they can't go after her without like supervisor approval and ultimately reporting it to the Secretary of Homeland Security that they went over after this person who's a victim. And so the way to get this system to work is to file the immigration case early. Now, obviously, sometimes it's too dangerous and you need to do the protection order first. But you need to be prepared that if you do that, they may try to send ICE after her, and you need to be prepared to do that kind of an advocacy. Now, we provide technical assistance on all of this. So if you're trying to figure out which should come first and how to balance those equities, that's the kind of training and technical system Rocio and I do on a case-by-case -case basis to help you think through those things. But know that the moment she files, now the other thing you can do is you can give her a, when you're working with somebody who's going to be filing a VAWA, a T, or a U, you can give them a letter from your agency saying, I'm working with her. And even if you're not the lawyer, you're the advocate, I'm working with her and her attorney, or you get the attorney to write the letter that says, we're in the process of filing a VAWA, a T, or a U for this person. Give her that piece of paper and tell her how to keep it safely from the abuser. But if any immigration enforcement person shows up, she's to hand them that paper. And that's that will it's supposed to stop them in their tracks. And it generally does. We've been able to get that to work because they're not. It's a way of saying I'm a victim. So hands off, essentially. Um, and so but filing as soon as possible is really important. So once you file, so they're not supposed to rely on perpetrator provided information. But once you file, it goes into this red flag, <laughs> you can go back, red flag system. And um, the, the case is sealed. So we, we wrote VAWA confidentiality because we believed, and it's turned out from a social science perspective to be true, that many victims would file while they're still living with their employer, living with their their. Uh, a perpetrator spouse or family member, or maybe they're being abused at their employment, you know, sexually assaulted at work or sexually harassed at work. Many people apply and then stay in those relationships and jobs until they get work authorization. And so this creates a confidentiality system that makes it impossible for the abuser, or the employer, you know, or the spouse to find out that this case even exists. Um, the other thing is there are protected locations that where immigration enforcement can't happen against victims, courthouses, rape crisis centers, family justice centers, um, uh, victim service providers, places like that. And then there's a range. We have lots of materials. I have a great, great tool, which I'll put up when Rocio starts talking, where you it's a one pager where you can see all the protected locations under current DHS policies where immigration enforcement can't happen absent the head of that ICE office agreeing and then explaining to the secretary why, why he allowed it to happen. So it really, you know, there's good, strong policies to prevent it. Next slide, please. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, let me just put down a note to myself so I don't forget to put that up. Okay. Um, we're gonna like now spend some time talking about the various different immigration remedies. And as we do this, 
I really want you um, to be aware. I see there's some legal services people on the phone, on the call. So some of you will be working in agencies where um, your lawyers will be filing these cases, but even advocates who are not working in legal services agencies can play a big role in evidence collection and in helping these cases because we find that advocates often have the really good trusting relationships with victims that strengthens their immigration cases. So, and I see I have a question. Yeah, I can t read it on to you, Leslie. Um, you know, it, you, the question it relates to filing early and and you know a long time a while back we used to recommend that people file early to get those VAWA protections even though maybe the clients haven't gathered all the documents yet because you know that takes sometimes a while um, so do you ever recommend filing bare bones applications so that it's pending and confidentiality protections are in place or should we wait and gather and then submit as soon as we can so my answer is, and I'm gonna give you an answer and I'm also gonna tell you what the adjudicators in Vermont, what we told them and what they told us. So yes, you should file bare bones applications. You wanna make sure you have enough information in your application to get a prima facie determination or a bona fide determination, whether it's a vow or a you. So you want enough of the basics, right? But it doesn't have to be everything. And we told the adjudicators people are doing this and we told them they're doing it because of our confidentiality protections because they've got an active perpetrator out there trying to get them deported. And so what the adjudicators said to us and the supervisors of Vermont Service Center when we were training them said, is please tell people if they do this, don't wait for the request for further evidence to give the additional evidence. So. File it early, but as soon as you get your case fully prepared, submit that additional evidence so that, and it will dramatically improve the speed at which your case is adjudicated. And what the adjudicators are telling us, if you think about it psychologically, it makes sense. They're seeing a fuller, more robust case by the time they get to adjudicate it without having to ask for more. Because if they have to ask for more psychologically, they're thinking, oh, maybe it's being made up. I mean, they have more fraud questions, right? So it's really important to do it as a, your plan is file early to get the protections, but then, you know, the time between, the time that you would get everything together and the time when the, are, the request for further evidence was come is a much, there's a big broad, there's a long time before you get a request for, for, for further evidence. It could be a year or so after filing. And so you don't want to wait that long to provide your additional evidence because you want the adjudicator to have the most complete case when they sit down to adjudicate it. Is that clear, Rocio? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Makes perfect sense. So why don't you tell us a little about the legislative intent since you were in the room when the, these laws were? <laughs> right. So Basically, there were a number of purposes behind the creation of VAWA, TU, and the amendment of special immigrant juvenile status in various ways. Um, we, you know, people wanted victims to feel comfortable coming forward and reporting crimes, not just to the police, but to the EEOC and to come to courts to tell judges about the harms they're experiencing and in custody and divorce and protection order cases. Um, we wanted to improve community relations between police and uh, immigrant communities. And the U visa could be a tool to, to help police do a better job of working with immigrant crime victims. Nobody should be a victim of crime without regard to immigration status. We knew that there were offenders that were preying on the most vulnerable in our communities that are often immigrants. And we knew that all, if you look at the U visa crimes and the crimes that VAWA self-petition and other things are, and, you know, domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, stalking, these are not, these are, these are recidivist crimes. These are not one victim. And that if we're going to stop these in our community and the implications that they have for the victim we're working with and subsequent victims, um, the feeling was that they, there needed to be there was crime fighting purposes of this, but also victim protection and healing purposes of this that were co-equal in terms of the goals. So we didn't create just one form of immigration status. There are a variety of, next slide please. Um, 
And so I worked really hard to get this document created. <laughs> um, this is a screening tool that was developed by the Department of Homeland Security and it was issued in 2017. Um, and it's, it, it, we have it in our materials and it's an active document. So if you click on the black squares, it will, the black circles, it will take you to, um, doesn't work on the screen though. Um, it will take you to the latest forms that you need for that case. If you click on the word VAWA or U visa, it'll take you to the webpage of the Department of Homeland Security where um, they discuss, they provide information about this remedy. And this is a set of forms of immigration relief that we've developed over time. Today, we're gonna be talking about the T visa, the U visa, um, SIJS mainly. I'll also tell you a little bit about continued presence. Um, the, those five forms of relief are ones the victims control and that they can file in the United States. Um, and they're the easiest ones to win compared to asylum. Um, Rocio, next slide. And the way I like to think about it is if you're working with a victim that or a survivor that any of these things happen to, the, the, they're eligible for one of those forms of immigration relief and maybe several of those forms of immigration relief. So this is basically the VAWA self-petition list, the U visa list, and the special immigrant juvenile status list of criminal activities and abuse all put together. And it's a good checklist to kind of keep handy. You can print it out and keep it on your desk if you want to know what might be eligible. Um, next slide, please. And so as you were saying, the important role that us as advocates could do, you know, we build that trust. Sometimes they come to us first, we're the boots on the ground so we can identify and screen for this, um, help them obtain documents, identity documents, police reports. Um, we're able to assist them in a trauma-informed manner that maybe some ways that attorneys cannot do. So I've seen victim advocates do amazing job in helping putting together the declaration and doing it in a way that can help immigrant survivors heal from it. Um, sometimes we see providing a letter of support to the application. It could be as short as saying that they came to you and that you provided service. And I've seen great letters that also have been key in helping the, the survivor access uh, immigration benefits by explaining how that person shared with them victimization and how they've been impacted. Um, collaborating with uh, U visa certifiers. We're gonna talk about the U visa, but that requires a certification from a law enforcement agency or prosecution office or other investigatory agency. And so having those relationships that advocates have with those agencies are key to helping that immigrant survivor access that certification because without it, they can't apply for the U visa. Um, also advocates are great at knowing the inadmissibilities or the things that maybe the criminal histories or immigration history that it, that a, an attorney might not know. And so um, helping attorneys flag that and that partnership with attorneys is, is very important for the survivor to be able to file the best case possible and then collecting all other forms of evidence that we'll talk about like shared documentation or protection orders. So advocates play a very important role in uh, supporting immigrant survivors access these forms of immigration relief. And so um, we got a question about what are some of the ways to help a client with a declaration awaken the healing. We developed a whole working with a psychologist, a forensic psychologist, and immigration lawyers and victim advocates. We developed a trauma informed approach, and we actually have something called. I don't know, remember what it stands for. We call it the SIQI. It's a, it's a trauma-informed interview questionnaire tool that walks victims through um, the history of abuse that they've suffered and, and everything that you need to collect for a VAWA self-petition or a U visa case to develop the victim's affidavit. And we work with lots of victim advocates who use this tool to help um, survivors develop their story and sometimes the victim advocates are the ones that do the first cut of the story and then get it to a lawyer who will tweak it and say, can you get me more of this or that or the other? And it's a big role that victim advocates play. And I and it's our trauma-informed interviewing tool is on this page, as well as an advocate's guide on how to use it. And I just put the link 
So you said, where can you find it, uh, Sandra? The link is in the chat just above. So if you click there, you'll get to a web page and it has all the, including I think webinars on how to use it and everything else. Great. Yeah, we, we find that they they really help when they write it themselves or, or work together with an advocate to write it themselves. And then, you know, later the, an attorney can can structure it in the way that maybe it will work better. But in writing that, survivors can can process some of that with the support of the advocate and heal in the process of it. Right. And the, the, the psychologist that we worked with to develop this is Marianne Dutton, who specializes in storytelling as a way to help victims heal. So the way I think about it is working through with your clients, this trauma-informed interview and the process of helping the victim writing her own story will help her heal whether or not it helps her immigration case or her family law case. And Leslie, if you can share the, the infographic right now as I start to tell about VAWA self-petition. Um, and so let's just take a look at what the VAWA self-petition remedy is. Um, it's the protection for victims of domestic violence or sexual abuse or other. The standard is battery or extreme cruelty. So it could be more than just domestic abuse and sexual abuse of abuse spouses, parents, or adult children. Um, so a quick little poll here is um, raise your hand if you've ever worked with on a family violence case where the immigrant victim and the perpetrator of the abuse was a citizen, lawful permanent resident spouse, maybe the abuser was a citizen or lawful resident parent, or a 21-year-old citizen child. Um, you can raise your hand here in the features of the Zoom. Um, but if you have worked with a victim whose abuser was, had immigration status. Okay. So a few of you have, and if you have, that pro would probably be the first question that I would wanna ask when I was scre screening for immigration relief, because the Lavawa self-petition has the better access to, and the, the, here's where it is in the infographic, we're talking about the Lavawa self-petition. Um, this chart also tells you what they, if they approve what benefits they would get and uh, it can explain the remedy to you. Um, but that, that would be the first question is asking about what, what immigration status um, the abuser had. Um, and so it provides immigration relief as if the person, the family member um, was petitioning for them in a confidential manner. The abuser doesn't have to know that they applied because all these are applied by uh, VAWA confidentiality applies for them. This, and also it does not require that there's law enforcement re, um, reporting. It doesn't require protection order. All those things are helpful, but it does not require any certain piece of evidence like that. Rocio, we have three hands raised. Do well, because we... I asked them to raise their hand. Oh, I see, I see, I see. I see. Okay, okay, we're good. <laughs> okay, so just here, breaking it down, who can file? It could be a spouse or former spouse of U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. Um, if we're going really fast, you're going to hear us say LPR, and that's what lawful permanent resident means. They can petition for their children that also are immigrants that don't have immigration status. An abused child or the children or even the stepchildren can petition also if they've been abused by that citizen parent or step parent or lawful permanent resident and parents of children that are U.S. citizens over the age of 21 can also apply for a VAWA self petition. Can I make one additional point and that is that in child abuse cases, the child who's abused, the child, whether it's a child or the stepchild who's abused, um, could be a U.S. citizen, um, and that the person who's applying for VAWA self-petition or U visa is the stepmother or the mother, or the stepfather or the father. So we wrote the law to protect, offer protection for children so that their immigrant parents could come forward and help the child deal with the abuse without regard to the child's immigration status. So you could have cases where the children is abused and the mom's not, and the mom's self-petitioning, or they're both filing together, but I just wanted you to be sure to understand that 
if you have a child who's been abused, if they have an immigrant parent, they qualify in the same way as everybody else. And here are the formal requirements. So the abuse, the definition that they're looking for is to look for battery or extreme cruelty. And you know, sometimes those two exist together. The abuse has to be coming from a US citizen or lawful permanent resident. It could be spouse, parent, step parent, children, adult, son or daughter over 21. They had to have recited or lived together at some point. There's not an extended period required. The person has to be of good moral character. That generally just means that they don't have any serious criminal history in the past five years. Um, they had, to, if the self-petition is coming because of a spouse, that they married them in good faith. And that means that they marry for any other reason in the world other than to get immigration status. And um, sometimes people are in removal proceedings or deportation proceedings in immigration court. And there's a remedy I wanted you to know, it's called VAWA cancellation of removal that has similar requirements. Um, somebody applying for the VAWA self-petition, the timeline right now, it, it looks a little closer to 18 months to 24 months. And um, we have in the, your materials a, a link to a webinar that's very detailed on VAWA self-petition and its requirements. If you wanna learn a little more about that. Um, the burden of proof that you show Vermont, uh, the service centers or immigration on it to submit evidence to support this criteria is any credible evidence. And so the definition of battery or extreme cruelty, it includes all forms of abuse that you see in civil protection orders. It, inform, it includes all forms of abuse that you see under our criminal state laws. And um, it also includes coercive behavior. Um, there doesn't have to be physical harm or crime or attempted crime required to be eligible for it or fall under the battery or extreme cruelty definition. I wanted to show you a tool that I use sometimes to talk about with immigrant survivors and they have it in other languages that the link will be there in your materials, but it's the immigrant power and control wheel. This version is coming from Futures Without Violence, um, but it explains how you know the power and control wheel that we see in, um, uh, in non-immigrant clients, how in with immigrant, survivors, it can look a little different. And these are some types of behavior and maybe covering each one with survivors can get them to think about the forms of abuse that they've experienced and everything on here would together or separately could be an, enough reason to be able to support a VAWA self-petition and showing a battery and extreme cruelty. And so the self-petition itself, you don't need the abuser help to help you petition for. Uh, immigration. The information is protected by VAWA confidentiality, so the information cannot be used against the victim. It's confidential. Um, the children can also be part of the application. Um, you can apply for this if you are undocumented, if you came in as a student, or any other temporary status. Um, there is a form that's very similar of protection for people that come in with uh, employment visas or H- and uh, other forms, H, visas, or G, A, or I, um, that can allow them to kind of petition similar to VAWA self-petitioners that allows them to stay and have work authorization. And I wanted you to know that that ex exists for those visa holders. And eventually- If I may, it was, it's A, E3, G, and H. Oh. oh. I you. wrote it, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, uh, if they're admissible, so that means if there's no serious criminal history or immigration violations, most VAWA self-petitioners can also apply for lawful permanent residency. So at the end, a VAWA self-petitioner will have that protection from deportation. As soon as they file, they go into that protected um, DHS red flag system that Leslie told us about. The children will get the same benefits. Um, they become qualified immigrants for public benefit purposes, and that can come as early as three months after filing when they get the prima facie notification. 
um, at that point, some people that whose abuser is a US citizen, they can also apply for lawful permanent residency simultaneously at this and um, can have their employment authorization at, as it, we were seeing it about six months right now, it's a little longer. Um, and um, lawful permanent residency can happen at approval or shortly thereafter and, and they can be able to access that immigration status. I wanted to red flag a few things. They must file two years after the marriage ends. That means like the final order of divorce, not when they started to file. We know some divorces take longer or two years after the abuser died. Um, some people um, are, are victims of bigamy. And so it allows somebody who is a second spouse, innocent spouse, also pe petition for the vow of self petition. Children that are abused, under the age of 21 have up to the age of 25 to file if they can show that the delay is due to the trauma of uh, victimization. And then Leslie, I wanted to ask you about she the- was wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> right. right. We just won a court case on this. And so divorce does not cut off this, the ability of stepchildren to apply. So that's changed, brand new law. It's a great case. Any of you work at legal services and you want to read a case in which the Seventh Circuit writes about Cinderella, it's quite good. We really won. It was a very big win. And the Department of Homeland Security adopted it. Great. So stepchildren do not have to file before a, a divorce. And that'll be the last time you see it on one of our slides. <laughs> but it gave us a chance for you to, to share that with us. Mm -hmm. And there has to be at least one incident of battery or extreme cruelty during the marriage. And so um, I'm imagining when once you got VAWA self petition passed, we we hear sometimes that you know sometimes the abusers don't marry those the, the victim or the, the the immigrant survivor, and you know that sometimes is part of the abuse, the stringing them along. Um, so there were many immigrant victims that couldn't apply or have the benefit of the VAWA self petition, and so there is the U visa for immigrant crime victims. In the chart, we're talking about the green section in the shield. The goals of the immigrant of the immigration relief are a little different. Here is, you know, part of the community policing strategy, part of a way to increase participation for immigrant victims in prosecutions and investigations. You know, if you look the the purpose of this was to promote safety in communities and victims and encourage victims to report crime because we know immigrant victims without status can be very vulnerable to those perpetrators. And so this, the goals of the U visa are a little different than the VAWA self petition. The U visa grants somebody four years temporary stay. Um, there is a cap, 10,000 visas per year, but you know, once you're filed, you have forms of protection and there's a wait list and it's long, but eventually they will have the U visa after approval. Um, it does require this U visa certification and it has to come by from certain individuals, um, it, you know, it, with coming from an in agency that has investigatory ability. And, but the U visa certification is just one part of the application and the victim has to show um, other parts of the application to show that they're eligible. And it's the same burden of proof of any credible evidence. Can and I just add something, Ro, uh, yeah. Rocio, that what's really important to, to note is that people think, oh, the U visa, it's going to take them 15 years or whatever to get the visa. So why is it worth doing it? And it's really important to understand that the Department of Homeland Security just revised all its policies that are going to result in speeding up access to work authorization for immigrant survivors, work authorization and formal protection from deportation, which they'll hopefully get, they were getting it, they were having to wait five years for that. We're hoping that's gonna start coming down towards two years or maybe even under two, under two years. So just so you know, they, they can live and work in the United States freely and not have to be afraid much earlier than they would get their U visa. Back to you, Will. Yeah, and then I wanted to highlight that resource. There's a new toolkit for law enforcement or prosecutors. If we have any of um, 
of you on the training um, toolkit. It's very helpful. It's very helpful as us as advocates and attorneys to just see the, the positive updates that the toolkit now has. And Leslie just shared the link in the materials, I mean, in the chat box. Um, this brochure we also have that can easily be handed out to immigrant survivors, and we also have it in several languages um, that explains the U visa and what it is for immigrant survivors. Eligibility wise, um, the person that's going to apply for U visa has to satisfy these components. They have to be a, a victim of a qualifying crime or, or criminal activity. And then the next slide, I'll just tell you which crimes. They have to possess information about that crime. The crime had to have occurred in US. The other big bucket that is a criteria of this is uh, the victim has to be helpful. So that means they have been helpful, are likely to be helpful in, it could be detection, investigation, prosecution, conviction, or sentencing. And then the last element is that they had to have suffered harm as a result either physical or mental harm as a result of the qualifying criminal activity. So here's the list of the crimes and they were there in that big list that Leslie gave us that had all the activities. Um, and, but it includes, if you notice, violent crimes, crimes of exploitation, um, it, several different criminal activities, they're named different in other states than maybe, you know, so sexual assault in one state. Here it has rape. Um, they're just general categories. We're not talking about that specific crime or citation. And also attempt conspiracy or solicit to commit any of these crimes would make you eligible for the U visa. So why have I been correcting myself saying crime or criminal activities? It's because it's just not limited to that crime. So you, someone can access the U visa even if the investigation doesn't result to a prosecution. Um, the victim does not have to testify at trial. Um, let's say the abuser leaves the country or, or leaves the jurisdiction, they can still access this remedy if the criminal case is dismissed or the abuser pled out. Um, if it becomes um, expunged, they can still apply for the U visa. So it does not require a conviction. Let's say they prosecuted them for another crime, they can still access the U visa. So prosecution does not have to take place. And let me just say that, that there doesn't even ever have to be a criminal investigation or prosecution. So you can have a victim who goes for a domestic violence or sexual assault protection order and tells the judge about the abuse, that's enough for U visa certification. That's enough. Same thing is if you have a case, let's say sexual assault in the workplace where the victim it reveals the abuse to the EEOC as part of their investigation, that also is sufficient. So it, it could be totally civil. There could be never anything criminal and they still qualify. And so it requires this visa, U visa certification. And I was telling you that victim advocates relationship or attorney relationships are, are very important with law enforcement. The book will sometimes say law enforcement, but the definition of law enforcement includes a wide range of agencies. So it includes federal, state, police, sheriffs, tribal, uh, campus police, um, prosecutors. It requires it to be the head of agency or for them to designate somebody um, or a supervisory uh, position to sign the certification. Judges, commissioners, magistrates, as Leslie said, the Department of Labor, the EOC. It could be our child and elder abuse agencies or any other government agency with investigative authority. There is no statute or limitation of when the crime occurred. Um, however, the victim has a six months to submit this certification when they file their case. And so one of the criteria was to they have to be helpful, right? So the certifying agency is the one that determines the helpfulness. It's a discretionary form, the U visa certification, where the agency determines whether to to sign, um, but there's no degree or timing of when the helpfulness is required. DHS is gonna look at the whole picture here. 
um, the agency could complete the youth certification as soon as they're able to detect helpfulness. Sometimes we'll see some victims that have a criminal history, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't apply for the U visa. The U visa has a waiver where victims can show that it's in the public interest for them to be in the U.S. And so uh, adjudicators that are reviewing the applications will weigh those two elements. And the investigation or the prosecution can still be ongoing. And if for some reason the agency wants to revoke their certification, there is a mechanism for them to reach USCIS and um, revoke that certification. Here are some examples of helpfulness. So calling 911, having a rape kit per performed, um, letting them know the description or where the perpetrator lives or what he drives, allowing them to take photographs of them of injuries, filing for a protection order, bringing the minor to court, maybe providing a statement of other acts, providing evidence in an abuse in a custody, child welfare, or, or divorce case if there's findings of that, and then testifying at a bond hearing, trial, or sentencing. So DHS is taking a victim center approach to this. Um, certification is signed um, for the qualifying activity. No conviction is required. No charges are required. The a vendor doesn't have to be arrested or prosecuted. I already told you about testimony. Um, so there, it's DHS is taking a victim-centered approach when determining helpfulness and when to certify. So last facts is that, you know, Leslie already shared with you that there's a faster way to get, uh, the DHS is working on getting the a bona fide determination and work authorization sooner. Um, the U visa has limited state benefits. And so whenever possible, if a victim is eligible for VAWA self-petition, you want to go that route. Um, after three years of having the U visa, if they have continued um, cooperation and have not unreasonably refused, they can apply for lawful permanent residency. And after five years of having the lawful permanent residency, they can apply for US citizenship. So one of the things to note is that immigrant victims of human trafficking, whether we're talking sex trafficking or labor trafficking, qualify for the U visa and they qualify for a T visa and they comply for both at the same time. Um, and we did that because there's certain elements of proof in the T visa case that are a bit harder to meet than in the U visa case. But the T visa, I would say the, the difference between the two of them are light years apart in terms of public benefits access. Are there any limitations on employment under the U visa? No. Meaning that once you get to the point where you get work authorization under the U visa, you um, uh, you 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 get employment authorization and there's no limitations on that. That gets renewed every few years while you're going through the process of waiting for your U visa, unless you commit a crime where that's really bad or something. <laughs> um, it'll be renewed. Uh, there's another question here. Maybe we should take it before we launch into the T Rosia. Sure. It's a uh, regarding you know the seeking the certification. So, any advice on dealing with police departments that have their own helpfulness requirement that is much higher than what USCIS requires? Our Attorney General issued a directive that was meant to streamline U visa requests to police departments, and instead it made things much harder. Police departments seem to have interpreted this to mean people have to request certifications from municipal court or a county prosecutor, and for many, that's not an option. Well, we have a brochure that we'll give you, and this is something we've spent a lot of time doing technical assistance on. One of the reasons we wrote the U visa in the way we did, and we're gonna have this webinar on helpfulness where we're gonna have judges and police and prosecutors all describe the various different ways that helpfulness and certification can happen. We knew that there would be police departments or prosecutors' offices or whatever who were anti-immigrant and didn't want to do the right thing and would try to come up with their own rules. DHS has a brand new 
U visa certification resource guide that to the extent the policies that your department has are in conflict with that. I mean, it's brand new. It's like a month ago. Um, and it's really good. So you may be able to get them a copy of that, which we'll post in a few minutes, or maybe Rocio, you can find it and post while I'm talking. Um, uh, it's, so that's one thing. We also have a brochure that talks about in most places, there are three law enforcement agencies that could certify without regard to wherever the crime occurred. People seem to think police, but often the sheriffs can certify as well. State police can certify as well. That's only state law enforcement. There could be FBI could certify. I mean, plus you have all different kinds of prosecution options. You have protection order judges. Um, there doesn't have to be a criminal case. So there are lots of ways to get at certification if you've got a problem with a particular police department. And it was designed that way. The other issue is, you know, if the victim is living in one jurisdiction and the crime happened in another. So, so let's say the crime happened where she was living with the abuser and she's fled to another part of New Jersey. She could seek certification from the police department where she fled to. It doesn't have to be where the crime occurred. So there's those kinds of issues that are, and again, this is exactly the kind of question we do a lot of technical assistance on. And we have, if you're in a jurisdiction where your police department would be interested in learning from another police officer or an expert nationally, a police officer nationally, or your prosecutors want to learn from a prosecutor, we have experts nationally who work with us who do that police to police, prosecutor to prosecutor technical assistance. Yeah, and we would be happy if if they request training from us. Um, we, that is part of our work, and so we do have a training for law enforcement. And we notice that most of the time that this happens when they try to streamline, um, they don't realize the the benefits for each particular agency. And we're going to go into that in the webinar why it's important that each agency continues to do certifying, because it it helps each them in a different way. Right. Exactly. Um, Rocio, can you give me a time check? Because I'm not, I'm confused about exactly how long we're going. You've got 30 minus four minutes. Okay, 26 20, minutes. 26. Okay, great. Um, perfect. Um, okay, so we're going to talk now. I'm going to give you a brief overview. I'm going to form the next two forms of immigration relief I'm going to be discussing are the T visa, three actually, T visa and continued presence, which I'm going to talk about now and then special immigrant juvenile status. While we're on this slide though, I'm gonna talk about continued presence. So continued presence is a form of immigration protection. It's temporary. That is like an emergency protection. It's like getting an emergency protection order. It's an, if in fact you've got a case where local, state or local law enforcement are involved and they're willing to go to federal prosecutors or federal FBI, et cetera, Local, local police can ask that a victim of human trafficking, either sex or labor, adult or child, could be granted continued presence if they are uh, a potential witness in a trafficking investigation or prosecution. So it's a very low bar. The trick is building relationships with local and, and federal law enforcement to get the federal officials to request it. So it's very similar that it's, you have to be a victim of severe form of human trafficking, which I'll be explaining for the T visa, but I wanted you to know that that option exists as well and we provide technical assistance on it. Next slide, please. So where do you think sex or labor human trafficking occurs? Can you type in the chat? What you're seeing or your thoughts about it? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> IT. IT. Yep, online. It's hidden. Yep. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So the major, the top venues uh, for sex trafficking are these massage parlors, spa business, pornography, online um, for sure, um, escort services, motels, residence based commercial sex. Um, and street-based. And then for labor trafficking, it's a much broader list. Next slide, please. I'm gonna keep you going here, Rocio. <laughs> um, and that's it's these, we see low wage jobs, um, sexual and non-sexual services. There's some differences by 
of gender differences by venue. Um, 4% of trafficking victims are multiple venues. And then you see agriculture, restaurants, private restaurant, um, you know, private homes, domestic servitude. I mean, you see there's tra there can be trafficking when, you know, people who work for, I don't know, I mean, you're in New Jersey, so they could be working for the UN and bring somebody from their home country over to care for their kids. And you could end up with that person being trafficked. So you have to think generally about all these different ways um, people may be trafficked. Next slide, please. So to, to meet the federal definition of human trafficking, there have to be three elements. You have to have a process of recruitment, harboring, or obtaining somebody. And that, and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, you have to have a means, force, fraud, or coercion, unless there's an exemption, we'll be talking about that. And then there has to be a purpose, which is either sex, trade, commercial sex, slavery, bondage, involuntary servitude. Um, and there have been some really good new policies coming out of DHS talking about how you can have trafficking within a domestic violence relationship. I'll be talking about that. Next slide, please. So let's talk about sex trafficking first. Um, this is the federal definition. So the process can be recruitment, enticing, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, um, Etc. Now, what you'll notice is nothing in here says you had to bring the victim across the border. So if you brought somebody in the United States for purposes of trafficking, it would count. But it many, most trafficking victims are not trafficked over the border into the United States. They're trafficked once they get here. Or there's lots of trafficking of US citizens as well. So but the federal, as, as a, so any of these things, soliciting, patronizing, you know, giving somebody benefits, financial, anything of value is the process. Force, fraud, or coercion are required. They have to be tricked in some way unless they're under the age of 18. And there's an exception for children for sex trafficking. And then the end has to be a commercial sexual activity. But that's an activity in which something of value is given or received. It could be money, it could be drugs, it could be food, it could be shelter, it could be clothing. So people tend to think money, but it's not just money, okay? Uh, let's look at labor trafficking. So labor trafficking is similar. It's a smaller list of the process, recruit, harbor, training, obtains. Let me explain to you what that means. First labor trafficking case I was deeply involved in was a um, poultry plant in Iowa where the mostly female and mostly child workers would show up to work in the morning and the employer would padlock the door from the outside. And they didn't know when they went to work, whether they were leaving at five or two o'clock in the morning until the employer opened the door. There was also sexual assault happening by a foreman, et cetera, et cetera. But that locking the door from the outside, that's obtaining. They're obtaining that those services. They're, that that so that gives you an example. It's some it's it's something that controls the vic, the freedom of the victim to leave the situation. Sometimes it's a padlock, but there could also be emotional ways and other ways to do that that also count. The means here you have to have force, restraint, threats of abuse, coercion, a scheme. Coercion is really this scheme or plan, all these words that are put here, but it's like coercion. And there's no exemption from force, fraud, or coercion for minors for human for labor trafficking. Minors have to prove the force too. Um, so for example, if a domestic abuser forces his wife and stepchild to work and he abuses both of them, the abuse itself is the force. Because if they don't work, they'll be abused further. So there, you can get the force that way. And the means, the end is uh, involuntary servitude, peon, debt bondage, or slavery. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Next That's slide. Like, yeah. yeah. How, how do you prove, and I'm not sure if, uh, maybe Sandra, you could tell us if you mean in the sex trafficking or in the labor context, or maybe you mean in both, but how do you prove process and means? Is it, Could an affidavit be enough? Yes. So um, the any credible evidence laws under the Violence Against Women Act apply. So it can be the affidavit of the victim or 
could be affidavits of a, a, a service provider who assisted her in escaping. It could be um, it could be a forensic exam. You know, uh, she could do a psychological examination that would eva validate the impact that would measure the impact of the harm of the trafficking on her. So there's lots of different ways you can prove it. But yes, an affidavit could be enough. Um, it's usually not. It's always better to have some corroborating evidence, but it is absolutely not required. And there are cases where the affidavit is sufficient, particularly when you're talking about kids. Um, you can run into that. Um, next slide, please. So coercion, um, I actually just deleted a slide that didn't go away, but anyway, we'll skip it next. Um, so this talks about coercion and it's a serious, it's threats of serious harm or physical restraint, any scheme or plan intended to cause, we need to put an E on that in the future, a person to believe that the failure to perform the act would result in serious physical harm or restraint and abuse or threatened abuse of the legal process could also count. Two, uh, next slide, please. Oh, good. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about process. I said it doesn't require, um, this is the process of, of recruitment, right? So it doesn't require crossing a border. It could be, the recruitment could be a marriage. It could be a dating app. It could be an adoption. It could be a guardianship. It could be a promise of shelter, clothing, food. Um, that it could be a process of isolating or locking up the, you know, physically holding or locking the victim um, or making the victim financially dependent. Um, next slide, please. In terms of means, um, <clears throat> this could be actual or physical, you know, actual or, or threatened physical or sexual abuse by, you know, to the victim, to their child, to a family member. Threats of deportation that we saw earlier, we were talking about that dynamic of the power and control over immigration status, the threats of deportation and things like that are part of the for evidence of forced fraud or coercion. Um, you know, cutting the victim off from her children, threats to make somebody homeless or not feed them, um, financial or psychological reputational harms. This is a really big one that people don't think about often. But you know that you're going to out somebody in the community. You're going to ruin. You're going to say, tell them, you know, that they're a prostitute. Can like everybody please mute? That would be great. Um, and then you know, forcing the victim to commit crimes. And and really think about it: is anything forced fraud or coercion are things that make victims stay, and and contribute to their loss of free will. Is the way to think about it. Next slide, please. So the other thing that another way to show means is the use of fraud. I think about this as bait and switch, right? You think you're entering into marriage and you're entering into a nightmare of domestic servitude. You're working 12 hours a day, not getting paid for your labor um, to this person you're married to. You applied for a job in a bar, you ended up in a brothel. You thought you were going into a factory, you lock, got locked in, I already gave you that example. Um, you thought you were being a nanny, you're forced to work on unpaid hours or you're forced to sleep with your boss. I mean, those are examples of fraud. Uh, did my not next slide? Oh, good, end. Um, <clears throat> so the end result is another key part of this. And this has to be involuntary servitude, commercial sex, debt bondage, slavery, peonage, peonage. And peonage is the use of labor bound in servitude because of a debt. So if, if, if somebody, like when they get a job and then they have to pay for their, their house, they're given housing that they have to pay for. They take housing money out of their paycheck and they take food money out of their paycheck. And they're, they're basically in debt bondage. They can never pay it off. Those are situations that, that count in that way. But also DHS has been very clear and there's some very good new policies on this describing how this involuntary servitude can happen in domestic violence relationships. Um, and so there's good information on this. I think that's the, uh, right, I put it in. So um, basically it's when the expectation of the victim's life is to fulfill the orders of the trafficker and that there's a demand from the trafficker to perform domestic labor at an unreasonable out level unreasonable hours and having to be constantly available for, for labor without regard to the 
you know, the will, health, or energy of the victim. And that's kind of how you think about the domestic servitude piece. And it's, it is very helpful. There's a lot of cases that would fit into this um, where, and it's always better to apply for a trafficking, a trafficking case, even when you have a VAWA self petitioner, because you always get more, if the victim needs access to public benefits, things like SSI um, aren't available to VAWA self petitioners, but they are available to trafficking victims. Next slide, please. So any, um, if you have questions about the trafficking, put them in the chat and I'm gonna move on to the last form of immigration relief that we're gonna discuss, which is special immigrant juvenile status. Next slide, please. So to be eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. Um, so again, here now we're in the orange square. Next slide, please. So um, this is, this is the, I think, the most overlooked form of immigration relief. So if you're working with a victim, particularly where the remedy is a U visa and they're including their child in their U visa case, if, how many, I mean, raise of hands, how many of you worked with an immigrant victim of domestic violence whose child was also abused by the father of the child, let's say? Okay, I see some hands. Okay. So anytime that happens, I'll let you keep putting your hands up while I'm talking, but anytime that happens, anytime you have a child who was abused by one of their parents, abused, abandoned, or neglected by one of their parents anywhere in the world, that child is eligible for SIJS. So sometimes people think, oh, it's only for kids coming over the border. That's not true. It, there are children coming over the border that will qualify for special immigrant juvenile status because they've been abused, abandoned, or by, neglected by a parent in their home country. But we see these cases all the time in the United States in family court. So any child who's been a victim of child abuse, child neglect, or child abandonment as defined by your state law is eligible for SIJS. And the reason it's a big deal is if you've got a child who's in their mom's U visa application, but they've also been abused by their dad, that child can get lawful permanent residency in no more than three years from filing. And we're talking about post-secondary educational grants and loans. We're talking about food stamps. We're talking about healthcare in many states, subsidized healthcare. Lots of things that the kid can get as a special immigrant juvenile status uh, applicant that they couldn't, that they either couldn't get under the U visa or they'd have to wait decades to get. So um, you always want to be screening for this. Um, and, you know, again, our, we can help you if, if you qualify for SIJS and one of the other immigration forms of immigration relief, we can help you walk through where, whether it makes sense to file for both. Um, so when to apply for one of these cases, they have to be under the age of majority under state law. Um, when they um, when they get an order from a state court judge, um, and let's go over, and they have to have an order, just like a VAWA a self a U visa has to have a certification, and a T visa. I didn't talk about this, but they can get a declaration that's helpful from law enforcement or prosecutors or judges. SIJS have to get an order from a family court. Next slide, please. So, um, and what the family court order is, is it's a judge, it's a court that has jurisdiction to order custody, care, or placement, or make a delinquency or dependency finding regarding a children, child. The child could be placed with their a non-abusive parent, could be placed with a family member, could be placed with you know, a friend of the family could be placed with a grandparent, could be placed with a state agency. All of that is fine. The court has to find that it's not in the child's best interest to return to their home country. Um, and the way they generally do that is by eliminating, you know, the perpetrators um, in the home country potentially or otherwise to show that there isn't, there isn't a caregiver that is, it's in the best interest to place that child within their home country. So it's not like there's not some random relative that one could say, maybe we could stick them here. If, if the 
you know, the ante in New Jersey is a great best interest placement for that child. And there are some other random relatives that the child doesn't even know in their home country. Under New Jersey, the it's New Jersey's best interest laws that apply, not El Salvador's or India's or someplace else. So they're applying, you know, and so the if the best interest is to be placed with the aunt in New Jersey, then it's not in the child's best interest to return to their home country without regard to drugs or gangs or anything else, because there's it's not the best placement for them. And you need to show that reunification with the abusive parent, the parent who committed the abuse, abandonment, neglect, is not viable. And so though, those are the three things that they have to get as in, a, in, a, um, in a court order to, to qualify. Next slide, please. And so decisions about care and custody of the children can happen for those of you in legal services and those of you that might do protection order work, it can happen in protection order cases, custody cases, divorce cases, paternity and child support, adoption. Um, we have a bench book on all of this um, that we can give you if you're working on one of these cases. Next slide, please. And so home country, not in the child's best interest, the way we think about it is we, you know, we say, okay, first identify any potential custodian. Somebody is really you know, who the court would have to serve. So you're going to look at mom, you're going to look at dad. You will look at any other adult that's been involved in raising the child. And that's as far as courts have to go usually. Grandparents don't even have rights in most states to be served in custody cases. Um, <clears throat> court order, you know, applies the best interest to, of the state law to the case. And judges need to make findings to illustrate why it's in the best interest to choose this person as opposed to that person and not choose the parent who was an abuser. Next slide, please. And the finding of reunification not being viable doesn't require termination of parental rights. It doesn't require, you know, that they, they can have visitation. But, you know, it, it, it is not that there's no contact between the parent. It is that the court looking at best interest is deciding this is where the child needs to be placed. And at this point, I'm issuing a final custody order and I'm not imagining any, any at this point in time that it'll be changed in the future. And that's sufficient. So that's what special immigrant juvenile status is. Uh, Rocio, back to you. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, you know, the, just like you said, this is the most underused. One of the participants did say they hadn't heard about this, and I can, I can see how a lot of the kids that are children of VAWA self petitioners or U visa could be eligible for that, especially sometimes when um, the abuser father is or mother is back in the home country. Mm -hmm. um, so, with this last five minutes, I just we wanted to share with you some of the just things to be aware of. And we're gonna go more into depth of that in the, our April 28th session. Um, but it just, and we wanna to try to save a couple minutes for questions. I'm going to, for the registration for the next um, webinar, I'm gonna open a question box there so that we can maybe start the next session or make sure we address the questions that you have lingering at the April 28th uh, webinar. And so if you have questions, just go back to that link and then I'll leave a few open box questions so that we can start with answering what you want to know most, especially if there are questions that you think of between now and the next month. Um, but we just wanted to remind you about having that holistic approach and we're going to talk about what services and what support services immigrant victims can access, but to think about housing, thinking about economic support, disabilities, judicial remedies, child support. Um, and healing, um, you know, the, it's really important to build the trust. I, I don't know how many times when I've interviewed immigrant survivors, it's hard to even get them to identify what their entry date was in the U.S. And so keep in mind that coming into the U.S. can be very traumatic and to be patient. And sometimes you have to revisit those questions and you're not going to get those answers when you need them, but it's when the immigrant survivor has that trust and that comfort to share with you. Um, believe them, validate their experiences, um, you know, provide that language access, respect that in some cultures they're not going to leave their abusers, respect the autonomy of the person of when it's safe for them to leave, try to respond to them in a culture responsive way, um, 
help plan with safety planning, um, explain the VAWA confidentiality protections. I wanted to give you a note about using interpreters and translators. Um, we all have to provide language access per Title VI, and so make sure we're meeting that uh, obligation and planning ahead for when interpretation has to happen, um, giving yourself that extra time for working with in interpreters and translators, because it'll make you know an, an hour consultation go maybe into two hours because of the interpretation. So we need our patience. Um, we want our interpreters and, and translators to be trained with those words of domestic violence, sexual assault, to be able how to be able to work with uh, clients from different um, cultures and being creative on how we access uh, language access. Um, being aware of your own reactions, you know, you have to practice self care in this work. And so being aware of your own reactions with knowing when you need to take a break, taking care of yourself as we support survivors and and learning about some self regulation techniques you can use to for a survivor that kind of has a traumatic episode while you're working with them. Um, go ahead and put your questions here on the chat i'm going to give you guys some. Can you tell an interpreter so that what can you tell an interpreter so that they're sensitive to a domestic violence victim? Um, I think there you would want to make sure beforehand to let them know the themes of what you guys will probably be discussing is, 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 is very important. Um, it's always good to have them vetted out or recommended from another agency. And so maybe using somebody for the first time, I would start them off slow before you get into something really deep into the domestic violence, because like you said, you have to make sure that they're sensitive to it. So it's good sometimes to get recommendations um, and lists from other organizations that have used an interpreter. Do you have any suggestions, Leslie? No, I think that's that's a good one. Um, and also, you know, give them an opportunity to opt out, right? If they're not com comfortable about the subject matter. Um, um, and yeah, go ahead and keep the questions coming. I'm going to tell you about some of the resources. We talked about a, a bunch of stuff, but we're here to provide technical assistance for you from here on out. As long as you reach out to us, you, we can be reached on email or, um, and you can call our phone line. Um, I sent you an invitation to come to part two. We're gonna talk about public benefits. We're gonna talk about a little bit about protection orders and other legal rights that immigrant survivors have. So save that date. Um, our web library, it has very helpful tabs on all the subjects that we cover. And it's very easy to find other webinars or other materials. And it also has a search box that works excellent. And so our web library is there for you 24 seven. We have a, we, we can continue to invite you to any of our events. And so we have a free webinar coming up on understanding the helpfulness component and ongoing assistance on the U visa. And so save that date and, and on the links, there is that ability for you to register right now. We run two groups, uh, a community of practice for victim advocates, both system-based and those that work in nonprofit organizations. Um, it's run by me, so you get to see me more, but um, if you're interested in joining, email me. Um, we also have one for law enforcement and prosecutors, so if you think that they can benefit from this information, it's taught by a law enforcement officer and a prosecutor, and they will answer their questions. We cover different subjects. That's also a group um, for system-based advocates in police or in prosecutions. So um, that's a good resource. And I can send you a flyer so you can share it to your partners and law enforcement or prosecutors. Rocio, and I think what we should also do is because there's some legal services folks on here, um, there's also a community of practice for family lawyers. So it might not be for you all, but there are we can send you guys when we do the follow up materials that link as well. So maybe you could put the link to all three communities of practice um, uh, on their on your um, on on the page. Yeah, I, I can. Any of you have good relationships with any of your judges locally? We also run a community of practice for judges, and actually, one of the founding judges, the founding judge um, for that community of practice, was Judge Susan Maven from Atlantic City.
and then just leaving you with the resources. But we've been we've been really good about sharing them to with you throughout. But we did make a web page for you to get them later, and the recording will also be there of this webinar. If you know some colleagues that weren't able to make part one but want to join to part two, um, that will also work. And so um, with that. Um, I think our time is up. Thank you for, you know, staying the couple extra minutes. And I'll leave you guys a, a section in the registration for upcoming questions. Um, and I have got a few hands raised or their claps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Jen, for coordinating this and inviting us. And we look forward to meeting with you on the 28th. And thank you for the work that you do, your commitment to the work, and for your participation in this and, and you know, learning from each other today. Thank you so much. Keep up all the great work. We really appreciate it.